Okay, uh, let's read Mark chapter 6. We'll read verses 1 through 13. They say this, He went away from there and came to his hometown. It's talking about Jesus. And his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. And he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Okay, this is our passage for this morning. The name of my message is How to Reject the Kingdom of God in Three Easy Steps. We want to learn our lesson from those who lived at Nazareth and follow a different course, don't we? So we have two stories here. They're kind of linked by a, a common pattern. We see the kingdom of God advancing in the, in the first story. Um, Jesus goes back to Nazareth, his hometown. Uh, in the second story, he's sending out the disciples. And in, in both uh, cases, they ex- uh, there's this experience of rejection that happens. Or in the, uh, in the second story, at least teaching for the disciples on what to do in case of rejection. So we deal with this, and then um, finally we see the kingdom of God advancing regardless of that rejection. And that's good news. The kingdom of God is advancing no matter what. And so this is our big idea here, is that the kingdom of God is advancing. This is what the Gospel of Mark has been saying. This is what it's been all about. Just to recap the last couple of chapters we had in chapter 4, Jesus sharing a number of parables, and they were all about the kingdom of God, and in particular, the advance of the kingdom of God. They were like variations on a theme, but story after story where Jesus is saying, I am bringing the kingdom and it is going to grow and spread. And then in Mark chapter 5, we have these um, recorded, these extraordinary miracles that happened. Um, we have Jesus going uh, out beyond the, uh, the region of Israel, going out into the Gentile world and establishing the kingdom of God even there, casting out a demon, doing these kinds of things. Uh, and then the, um, the amazing stories that we heard about last week uh, concerning even a girl who had died and Jesus able to raise her from the dead. And so we see the, the kingdom advancing, Jesus establishing his rule and his reign. And just to say here, the the second story in our uh, teaching this week, uh, we'll spend most of our time on on the first story, but the second story is a significant step forward again in Jesus, uh, bringing the 12 together and commissioning them and having them do the same things that he was doing. This is a significant thing. It's no longer a a one-man show of Jesus by himself. It's him uh, gathering and calling his church together, equipping them, commissioning them. It's significant that he calls uh, 12 disciples. Uh, You know, Mark in his lightning fast pace, he doesn't even pause to mention their names um, because that's not the point. The point is, is that God is doing something new here. The 12 correspond to the 12 tribes of Israel. This is Jesus saying, I'm making my, my new nation here and they're going to accomplish what Israel failed to do. We're gonna do something new here. 
But it's worth saying too that this all uh, culminates in uh, Mark chapter 8. And so we see lots of miracles and healings happen, but uh, we want to understand too that that's not uh, the end goal. Uh, In a sense, they are signs of the kingdom of God coming and they're things that we should absolutely believe for and expect for. But all of these things that are happening, uh, again, gather to this point in Mark chapter 8 where Peter confesses, you are the Christ. I believe that you are the Christ. That's what this is heading towards, is people bowing their knee, recognizing the Lordship of Jesus and their lives being changed. You know, at the end of the, of the gospel, right near the end, Pilate asks Jesus this question, are you the King of the Jews? And that really is the central question. That's what all of this is heading towards, is we have a King and who will recognize that, who will submit their lives to his lordship. But within all of these things, the kingdom of God is advancing and it is worth uh, pausing here, I think, a, a minute longer because this is the message of the book of Mark. We need to see this and understand this and be encouraged by it uh, and have faith in it. I mean, I feel so encouraged to talk right off of the back of Scott's prophetic word. This is so much what he was saying, wasn't it? That there is, in the world, there is always evidence to the contrary. There's always things that we could look at and be discouraged by in our faith. But the truth is in the word of God and in the world today, we can look with eyes and faith and see, no, the kingdom is advancing. It, 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 it is. You know, I have the privilege of directing the school of worship and it's just amazing. It's amazing to think that in Kenosha, Wisconsin, 2,000 years after Jesus lived on the earth as a man, I'm collecting a bunch of teenagers who are giving nine months of their life and paying $7,000 to learn how to submit their lives to Jesus more fully. Is that not an incredible thing? I mean, if you just start to meditate on that, there's a lot of encouragement in that. Jesus is at work. He is advancing his kingdom in all kinds of ways. And a big issue for us is faith. Do we believe it? Do we see it? Do we orient our lives according to it? So the work that Jesus began in his earthly ministry, he's been carrying on since then. Uh, God is at work right now. You know, we sang this morning about Jesus being the one who was and is and is to come. Uh, But it's interesting in in the book of Revelation where it says that and it uses that formula, there's a kind of interesting play on words uh, where when it says he is to come, uh, it actually reads uh, technically he is coming or he is always coming. And so we live in the last days between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. But what is he doing in that meantime? He's coming. He's always coming. He's always working. If we have eyes to see it, if we will believe it, uh, then this is uh, this is the reality. It's bigger than us, you know. In that sense, it doesn't matter. um, First of all, how we respond to it, or even whether we believe it. This is just the truth. This is what Jesus is doing. He is establishing and advancing His kingdom. Now, this, uh, this story that we're looking at uh, this morning, though, adds a new element. What we see is that it is possible to reject the kingdom of God. And it functions in the book of Mark like this discordant note. We see the kingdom of God uh, advancing. We see all the evidence for it, but we see these people who, for various reasons, are rejected. And the kingdom of God, in that sense, passes them by. And so what this story uh, is supposed to do to us is to wake us up. It's supposed to challenge us. It says the kingdom of God is advancing, but are you a part of it? Are you receiving it? Or is it passing you by? This is the the same, this is the whole theme of the book of Numbers. When we go back into the Old Testament there, we see God advancing his kingdom at that time. He's rescued the people out of Egypt. He's bringing them into the promised land. And that's what he's promised to do. And that's what he is absolutely going to accomplish. But the whole book of Numbers is about a generation who missed it. Now, there's never any question whether God is going to be successful in his plan. The only question is, 
Are we those who believe it, receive it by faith and are a part of it? Or does it pass us by? And so we read the book of Numbers and we read our story today and we say, I don't want to be those people. I want to learn the lesson from these stories. And I want to engage with everything that God is doing. In the book of uh, Hebrews, um, the author there um, is kind of commenting on this story. And I, ju- I just want to read a passage of, of what he says in that moment, because again, I think it's um, so helpful and so important for us. And so Hebrews chapter three, starting in verse seven says, therefore, the Holy Spirit says today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care then, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in the rebellion. And then jumping down a few verses in chapter four, it says, since therefore it remains for some to enter his rest and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, calling it today, saying through David so long afterwards in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Do you guys hear what the author is saying here over and over again is that God is concerned about today, that God is coming to us today, that God is doing something today. And it's for us not to let it pass us by but to say everything, whatever God is doing today, I want to be a part of that. I want to engage with what God's doing. Again, the people of Nazareth, they had this today moment. Where's Jesus today? He's in Nazareth. What are we gonna do today? So it becomes very important for us to understand their reaction to him, what happened in their hearts, how did they miss it so that we can learn those lessons and not make those same mistakes. Does that sound good? So firstly, they were offended by him. It says they took offense at him, didn't they? At first, there was this kind of questioning of, wow, this, this man with this amazing teaching, how did he get these things? How is he performing these miracles? But then in their thoughts, they took a, a nasty turn. They said, isn't this just the carpenter? Don't we know his brothers and his sisters? And it says they took offense at him. So what happened here is they had expectations for the kingdom. Uh, We know this about the people of Israel at that time, that it was a time of great expectancy for the kingdom of God. So they were waiting for it and looking for it. But when Jesus brought it, it didn't quite fit their expectations. And so they took offense at it and rejected it. And what I want to say here is that God frequently comes to us in ways that surprise us, ways that defy our expectations uh, and ways in which it is possible for us to be offended. You know, God is um, free. He's absolutely free to do whatever he wants. He feels no pressure to conform to our expectations or what we think he should be like or what we think he should do. He's absolutely free to do what he knows is right to do. And we are frequently wrong about these things. This is something that we need to get our head around is in our thoughts about God and again, who he is and how he should act, what he should be doing in my life or your life. Our thoughts are just often wrong. We don't have the perfect wisdom of Christ. And so what this requires of us is humility before God to say, God, whoever you are and whatever you're doing, I want to receive and embrace that. You know, when um, 
uh, back a number of years ago when we just had Jed, um, we were ch- trying for another child and to grow our family. Um, there was a, a while uh, where we were trying and Kim didn't get pregnant. And at a certain point, um, we were having a conversation and Kim said, I would just love for God to speak to us uh, about this. Um, I would just love a word from him to know that we're thinking the right things and heading in the right direction. Um, that would just be really encouraging and helpful to me. And what I said to Kim was, I, I hear you, but I, I don't feel like I need that. I feel like I read the first page of the Bible and it tells us to be fruitful and multiply. That's, that's all we need, so, so it's okay. So, uh, and, God, and God, Kim said, um, uh, yeah, different people. <laughs> uh, Kim said, I hear you, um, but still, uh, a, a word would be nice. That'd be encouraging for me. And, and I say, well, maybe God will bring it. I don't think he will, but maybe he will. But then I said to her, Kim, even if he did bring a prophetic word, I'm sure that it wouldn't have any kind of time reference to it. Because I think we're just to trust God in the waiting. Now that conversation was on Saturday morning. Uh, The next day at church, Tracy Bloom got up and brought a prophetic word and said, God is bringing us into a season of increased fruitfulness. And as a sign of this, I believe that there are women who have been trying to get pregnant, uh, but haven't yet, and they are going to get pregnant. And uh, so I, okay, (laughs) there you go. (laughs) Now Tracy came up to Kim afterwards and said, uh, listen, I just want you to know that I believe that this was specifically for you. I think you should count yourself into this word. And then a week later, she emailed Kim and said, Kim, I should have said this at first. I was just, I was kind of hesitant to do it, but I felt like God gave me a time frame for you. I believe that you're going to get pregnant within three months. And I kid you not, three months to the day from that prophetic word, uh, Kim took a pregnancy test and called me and said, I'm pregnant. Three months to the day. <laughs> And so I said, okay, I'm going to stop speaking for God. (laughs) I don't think that I know what he's going to do. You know, for Kim, that was an incredible kindness of God uh, to her. But for me, it functioned as a rebuke. Uh, Have you become so wise that you think you know all the... Do you think you know better than God? is the message that I took from that. And so there's a certain humility, there's a certain approach that we take to God, which is I am probably wrong. There's a certain approach that we take to scripture, which is I'm thinking wrong about something. And I might not even know what it is, but I'm gonna let the word of God, I'm gonna let God come to me and change me because I don't want to be like these people of Nazareth who were offended that God didn't line up with what he wanted them to be. Again, going back to chapter eight, where Peter uh, confesses, you are the Christ. It's fascinating because just a couple of verses after that, God is saying, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. And so as soon as we are in earnest, begin our discipleship to Christ. God is interested in reshaping our thoughts, that there's so many things in our minds that are just the thoughts of man. And Jesus is saying, I want to come to you and and change you. I want you to be moldable in my hand. In other words, there's there's a fundamental type of faith that says God is good when I don't understand him, when he hasn't done what I thought he should do, he is good. And I believe it's this first kind of faith that allows us to have the second kind of great faith. I'm believing God for this. I'm believing God for that. It's underpinned by this foundation of God is good and whatever he does. It stops God becoming a cosmic candy dispenser for us It's a good check for our hearts that my relationship to God isn't just, I want the things that I want from him. And those are my terms or those are my expectations. Saying, no, God is good and I'm submitted to him. In my moments of confusion, when I don't get it, when I don't like it, I submit to him. I receive him. And then I reach to God in faith. Second thing that, uh, that 
uh, these um, folk from Nazareth were offended by, this isn't my second point yet, but the second thing they were offended by was Jesus's humanity, right? They just couldn't get their head around. We know this guy. We saw him work in carpentry for 10 years. How could this be the Messiah? How could this be the bringer of the kingdom? And they just couldn't get their heads around the fact that God uh, had come as a human, which fair enough, that's mind blowing, right? Uh, but this is very important for us to understand because God uh, in his infinite wisdom always works through humans. That when God was accomplishing his, his greatest work of salvation uh, for the human race, that he, how did he do it? He said, I'm gonna come as a human being. I'm gonna accomplish this as a human. And how is he extending his work now? It's through uh, human beings. That's how God works. So it's not enough to believe, yes, I believe that God is at work in the world. I believe that he's doing these things. What we've got to do is, I believe that God is at work in the world through you, <laughs> through that very ordinary person sitting next to me. In other words, we've got to see the body of Christ not through natural eyes anymore. This is just a collection of people in the room. Uh, we have to believe this is the body of Christ. And when we do that, I believe that we'll jump on board with what God is doing every day, every today. You know, when someone brings a prophetic word in the morning, you're thinking, oh, so-and-so, is. this is what so-and-so has on their mind today. Or are you thinking God himself is working through this human being? Home group. Are you thinking, yep, yeah, this is just a group of people in the room? Or are you thinking this is a little expression of the body of Christ where he wants to work, he wants to refresh us, he wants to renew us because that is what God is doing. In other words, God, I believe, wants to be at work in your life and he wants to do it through ordinary people. He wants to do it through your wife or your husband or your kids or your friend. And we need to see that and embrace it, embrace what God is doing in us. Okay, second thing here is that a uh, second mistake that, that um, the Nazarenes made is that they showed Jesus uh, dishonor that Jesus' reply to them is that a prophet is, is not without honor except in his hometown. And so what Jesus is saying here is, I'm not even receiving the honor that would be due to a prophet, let alone the Messiah, the Son of God coming among them. And so it's important for us to think about, about this. What is honor? What's the dynamic that's going on here? And what I wanna say here is that honor is more than just showing respect. Uh, biblically, is more than just an outward uh, show of deference or respect, these kind of things, but the honor is a inner calculation of the value of something or the weight of something. Uh, and then it's a determination to treat that person in terms of that weight or that value that they have. To dishonor something then is to treat something with less value than it has, to treat something as ordinary or everyday when it's not. And so for example, in the Bible, um, <clears throat> one of the 10 commandments we know is uh, for children to honor their parents, honor their father and mother. And again, what this is saying is more than just show them respect, but what it's saying is uh, view their uh, role in your life, view their voice in your life as more weighty, more valuable than any other voice and respond to them according to that. Or in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, just to give another example here, I think this will be on the screen. This is Paul talking about the body of Christ and he says, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker um, are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And so this is an encouragement for us, again, not to just view people according to our, our natural eyes or our natural estimation, but to see within the eyes of God, the value that he has placed on every member of the body of Christ and to honor them in that way. And so when we're talking about honoring God, we're talking about a whole life that's oriented towards him. We're talking about one that's made this inner calculation and decided God is infinitely valuable. That his presence, that his words in my life, that his law is worth more, is weightier to me than anything else in life. 
And I want to say that we live in a, a light and kind of frivolous culture that tends to give value and weight to nothing. Uh, we get sucked into this pace of life that can tend to just numb us to the weightiness of God. And again, we've talked about this quite a bit, but I think this is such a plan of the enemy uh, that he's not going to work hard to make you hate God, but if he can just get you distracted enough to see the things of God as light, as inconsequential, then I think he'll be quite happy with that. Let me, let me give you just a little example of this. Um, in my uh, past, um, I, you guys know that I'm from England. And uh, we, um, so, so I follow uh, the English soccer league, or as I call it, the English football league, because we play it with, with our feet, okay? Um, <clears throat> but they typically play their games on Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. And because of the time difference, that is Saturday morning and Sunday morning. Uh, and so in the past, in my precious seven minute break in between the worship and the teaching, I have been known to get out my phone and just get a quick update on the score. Not during the worship time, never during the teaching, but in that precious seven minutes in between. And at a certain point, God convicted me on that and said, you ought not to do that. And I wondered why. It seems like if it is a crime, at least it's a victimless crime, right? No one, no one is losing out. I'm just quickly checking the scores. But what I felt like God said to me was that you're, you're not giving honor to me and you're not giving honor to this special time of the week when the church is meeting together. Does that make sense? You're, this is a special time where the body of Christ meets together to worship God and to grow up in Him. And you're treating it like any other time of the week. You're treating Saturday, Sunday morning like Saturday morning. And, and I don't want you to do that. Now, why would God care about that? Why is God so concerned that I honor Him in this way on a Sunday morning? Was God offended? Well, I think the answer is this. We, we tend to think about giving honor in terms of the one receiving the honor. But actually, when we fail to give honor, the person who's affected is us. It's always us that when we don't give the honor uh, that we should, the person who should have received it is relatively speaking unaffected, but you miss out on what you should have got from the relationship. Again, going back to this example of uh, parents, uh, of children honoring their parents, I don't believe that God gave that commandment because he wanted parents to feel good and respected. It would be nice for them to feel respected, so I'm going to have parents give them that respect. I believe that that command was entirely for the kids, right? That as you're growing up, there's all kinds of voices that will come into your life, and most of them will lead you astray, but you have these two voices from your father and mother, that are going to lead you in this right way. And so in order to receive that blessing, I want you to honor them. I want you to give those voices the full weight that they deserve. Or again, in our passage in 1 Corinthians, where Paul is talking about honoring every member of the body, I don't think it's because Paul felt that every member of the church was a special snowflake and they all needed to, to feel special no matter what. I think it's because he genuinely believed that the church is the body of Christ and they were all supposed to build one another up. And that if I dishonor someone, if I despise someone, then I cut off that channel of blessing that I can receive from them. And so when Jesus was dishonored in Nazareth, it doesn't seem like he was overly concerned about it. It's not like he was kicking the can down the road. No, they just didn't honor me in that place. And I couldn't do any mighty miracles except lay my hands on a few people and heal them. Which, by the way, <laughs> it seems like a pretty good day to me. <laughs> I mean, if that happens at the end of our talking time and I heal a couple of people, I'm not going to go home and say to Kim, no mighty works today. <laughs> but anyway, Jesus had a, kind of, a whole different level, didn't he? My point is this, is that Jesus just moved on. He was unaffected by the lack of honor, but it was the people of Nazareth who missed out on this blessing that they could have received. 
Again, when he gives his disciples instructions in the, in the next passage, I want you to go and I want you to minister and to do these things. And if a town rejects you, it's interesting because he doesn't say, hey, take courage. You're just beginning this thing. You know, keep practicing. You're, you're okay. He just says, no, move on to the next place. You're fine. You're unaffected by it. It's that, those people who have missed out. And so when we're talking about honor, the issue is always for those of us who should be giving the honor. And when we give the honor that is due, we receive blessing in a way that, that we cut ourselves off from otherwise. And so what do we need to do? We need to honor God. We need to put weight in him, in his words, and not in our circumstances. I believe that we do need to treat the gathering of his people as special. If we've taken a, a turn in our mind and think, oh, it's just Sunday morning. I wonder who's preaching today. If we've taken home group to be a take it or leave it thing, these kinds of things, I believe that we need to put weight back in those things. I believe that we need to honor God in these kind of ways. And I believe that as we do, we'll see the blessing of God flow to us. Second Corinthians 4.17 says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. This is just another little example of how we do this. We look at our circumstances and say, I'm just not going to put all my weight in that. I'm going to view them as light and momentary and see God and what he's accomplishing as the weightiest thing. Is it 10 o'clock right now? Yeah, okay. All right, final thing then here is um, <clears throat> that they did not believe uh, Jesus. We know this because uh, <laughs> Jesus gives us this kind of haunting statement, which is that he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled. Now, there's been lots of marveling going on in the book of Mark so far. In fact, the last two or three stories have all ended with, and they marveled, or some kind of similar phrase. But now here it's Jesus' turn to marvel. He's looking at the people of Nazareth and saying, I'm amazed at them because of their unbelief. Oof. <laughs> I don't want to be that person. But it's helpful here, uh, working through the passage to see what belief is and isn't. That Jesus, I don't think he's concerned with the uh, level of feeling of excitement that they had in that moment towards him. And again, when we're thinking about responding to Scott's word that he brought this morning, I don't think that the encouragement of God to us is feel more excitement again. I believe that this issue of faith and unbelief is wrapped up in all of the things that we've talked about up until now, that I don't take offense to God. I submit my life to him and then I give him the honor that is due to him. And I think that when we do that, God says, wow, there's some great faith. That's what living in faith is. I think it's important, important to see this because sometimes we misunderstand this passage to make it uh, kind of a technique of faith. And if we just reach that right level of faith, then God will be released to do these miracles. I'm just not feeling enough. How can I whip myself up to this point where I have enough faith and God is released to do these things? Kind of like Elf, you know, the Christmas meter. There's just not enough faith. And all of a sudden there is. And Okay, never mind. <laughs> The point here is that Jesus is looking for a people who are devoted to him, a people who will accept him and honor him. And when we live in that way, he said, I see great faith. I'm going to bless these people. I love the, the points that Jeff made about this last week. Remember, he gave us seven encouragements for living in faith. Uh, and if you remember, none of those were uh, techniques in order to feel more faith in the moment, all of them with this whole life approach towards God that is living in faith. And so Jesus is looking for a people of faith to work in and through. And I just want to say one more time that he's looking for that today. That this is really the issue in this story is what are you going to do today? that I believe that this story is supposed to snap us out of living for God in theory or living for God in principle or living for God one day and bringing home to us this question of what am I doing today? 
And so if I could, I'd just love to take one minute, if you guys could close your eyes. The pattern of our Christian lives is today. And so I'd love you to just take a minute and ask God, what do you want me to do today? What are you speaking to me today? Is there perhaps anything that I've put, been putting off that I could do today? And I want to encourage you as God brings something to mind, whether it's small or big, just determine in your heart that I'm not going to put it off. I'm not going to treat it as a light thing, but I'm going to put weight in the words of God and I'm going to respond to him today. Amen. God, we love you. We recognize you. We honor you. We honor you as the one who is alive and well today, who's moving, who's coming. I believe that you're coming to this congregation. You're coming to each one of us. And Father, we want to be those who respond. See you respond quickly, respond well. God, we want our lives to give you all of the honor that you deserve. We want to live lives of faith and response before you. And so, Father, I pray that this word, that these scriptures would have their way in our hearts today and this week. God, that we would be molded, we would be changed, we would be matured by your word and by you coming, um, walking and working amongst us. Jesus Christ, we love you, we honor you. Amen.